Hey everyone, my name is Irene and I'm on the product management team here at iRobot. iRobot is made up of a lot of passionate people around the globe who come together to collaborate. We're going to meet a couple of those people today. So why are we taking apart a Roomba? Well, taking something apart is one of the best ways to learn how something works. Especially with robots that have multiple components that need to come together to perform one function. For example, on the Roomba, it's cleaning intelligently. So, let's get started. We're gonna start taking this robot apart. We're in Lewis's lab right now. Lewis is an electrical engineer at iRobot. And so let's begin. Number one rule is to start with the safety classes, right? All right, so we have this bumper. We have a variety of sensors, um, but the first step to taking apart the robot is to flip it upside down. All right, let's take out the rubber rollers. So we have two. These are our rubber rollers. Uh, they have chevron shaped fletches on them. The fletches are used to pick up debris and basically scoop them into the bin. We have a piezoelectric sensor right here. Um, we use that for our dirt detect feature. Uh, it basically listens for uh, a lot of noise, which tells us that there is a lot of debris on the ground um, and that we need to do a deeper clean. First up, we'll take the bin out. Mm -hmm. This bin has no electronics. It's what's considered a washable bin. So the older ones uh, had a motor assembly built in them, so you couldn't wash or clean the bin as easily as the new generation. And when we wash it, we want to take the filter out, correct? Yep. Great. Uh, next step would be to remove the side brush. So we use this side brush to pick up debris, and you'll see that with the sweeping motion, the debris in corners and on edges of walls will be swept into uh, the bin as well. Uh, next step is to remove the bottom protective cover. Um, the bottom cover serves to provide protection for the battery and the electronics. It also provides a smooth surface so the robot can transition over obstacles and anything that might be on the floor. And that's held in with screws that are actually marked for easy serviceability. and the battery's already been removed from the robot, so we don't have a battery. Just as a precaution, whenever you take apart an electronic, make sure that the battery is up for safety. Uh, so we currently don't have a battery in this robot, but if we did and we wanted to charge this robot, uh, we would line up the charging contacts uh, with the proper mate on the dock. So for all of our robots, they know how to find their own home and they know how to dock so that these metal contacts meet with the contacts on the dock. You'll see that there are two features that are lining up here between the dock and the robot. We call that the Archon. Lewis, can you tell us more about the Archon? Archon is an optical sensor built into the robot and the dock. The first feature of the Archon is to provide what we call a halo. It's an invisible circle of light in infrared around the dock, and that prevents the robot during a mission from accidentally bumping into the dock. The second optical feature on the robot is on the front here, there's a little IR window and inside the window are two emitters, we call them binoculars, and essentially it produces two beams of light, and when the robot decides to drive onto the dock to do it with precision, it uses the Archon to look at those two beams of light and tries to stay in the middle. So as a Roomba docks, you'll notice it slowly zigzags left and right, and the closer it gets, it turns into a perfectly straight line and then drives onto the dock. And that allows us to make the robot contacts as small as possible and as efficiently not use up space for other functions and still land on the charging dock. Around the perimeter of the, of the robot we have cliff sensors. Those are optical sensors that detect essentially the lack of floor under the robot. So if it's driving up to the edge of a step or a landing, as soon as a signal is no longer reflected back from the floor, the robot comes to an immediate stop to prevent itself from falling over. We have four front cliff sensors and two in the back so if the robot is spinning around and backing up it doesn't back off a cliff as well. So right here we have an optical mouse sensor. This works exactly like the laser mice that you would have connected to a computer. This laser shines down on a surface and then will track the movement so for our robot's case it'll know in which direction and how far it's, it's going. Our mobility system here is made up of these two wheels and a caster. As you can see our wheels aren't connected here. Um, we have three wheels because three points of contact make a plane um, and we have two wheels that drive independently so that we can spin in place. This is really important for our mobility system because we can get out of tight spots. 
All right, let's take apart the meal module. All right, we have our right wheel module now. You can hear clicking. We'll take apart the module so we can see what that's about. Just be careful when you go to take that plastic cover off. Yeah. The spring is under tension, so when you pull it off, it's gonna try and snap back. Oh, okay. Tell us a little bit more about the insides of the wheel module. Okay, um, inside the wheel module is essentially a, a DC brushed motor, and a brushed motor is one of the simplest motors you can design. Um, you give it a DC voltage from a battery, um, and it will turn in one direction. If you swap the polarity, it will turn in the opposite direction. Um, they're very reliable, they're very powerful, low cost. Um, that is connected to, inside this plastic, a gearbox, which essentially is a transmission. It lets us optimize torque from the motor, to give us the best performance and battery life and traction to the robot. Um, as we already mentioned, there was a spring inside the robot, and that provides essentially a shock absorber or a suspension for the robot, so it, it forces its wheels to stay on the ground at all times. You may not hear it, but there's a little switch sound. That is a micro switch, which you can kind of see in here. Um, the micro switch lets the robot know that its wheels have left contact with the ground. And that's a safety feature. If someone picks up the robot and the wheels, wheels stop turning immediately. Another part of the assembly is a small magnetic disc. In order for us to know how fast the wheel is turning, this is a magnetic encoder. It essentially just counts the number of revolutions and essentially it becomes like the speedometer in your car. We'll take the other wheel console out. All right, so here's our wheel module, take it apart. And as I mentioned, it's a DC motor uh, found in drills and tools throughout the world. Um, and it runs off a battery. And I just have here under the bench a 12 volt battery with some leads. And if I connect it one way, red to red, black to black, you'll notice the wheel spins in one direction. We'll call that forward. If the robot decides it has to stop and go the other way, all we do inside the robot is switch the polarity and it spins the other way. This is the front caster assembly which provides mechanical stability for the robot at all times. Um, it's easily removable for cleaning. Lewis, how does that stay in there? Uh, there's a machine feature on, on, the, uh, on the central shaft that's okay. held in and it just snaps in place so... And it's pretty for good, but easy enough to remove without tools. So on our older models, uh, our casters actually um, were black and white. Uh, Lewis, can you tell us a little bit more about why? Yes. Uh, on the older robots, um, in order to determine if the robot itself had become beached or basically bottomed itself out, uh, the wheels would still spin. So we mentioned there was a speedometer built inside the wheel, wheel module. The robot would think it's moving, but in actuality it wasn't. It had no way of, a second way of knowing I was moving. The modern robots have the optical mouse sensor, which is looking at the floor. So if the robot says, I'm spinning my wheels, and the mouse sensor says, I'm not, we can say, we're not moving anywhere. The older robots didn't have the optical mouse sensor, so what we did is we painted the wheel caster half black, half white. So if we didn't see white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, we weren't moving. So the i7 is our first robot that has this little fuzzy guy feature. Uh, Lewis, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, this essentially is a series of carbon brush fibers, um, and its function is to dissipate static electricity so it doesn't build up on the robot. An unusual fact about robots is as they move across different floor types, since they have spinning parts of different materials, it builds up a static electricity, just like if you shuffled across the carpet in the dry winter day. So the idea behind this brush is as the robot's continuously moving around, it's bleeding off the charge, so it doesn't get a chance to build up that much voltage. Okay, let's take out the cleaning head. Okay, so that should be one, two, three, it should be four screws. Cool. If you notice, when you loosen the screws, they don't come all the way out, they stay uh, kept held in place. And that's for easy serviceability, so when you pull the module out, the screws don't fall off and scatter across the floor. Alright, we have our cleaning head. So Lewis, let's talk about the suspension within the cleaning head. Sure. Much like the wheel assembly, which the robot has to adapt to different floor heights and types, when transitioning over a threshold or a transition to different floor types, if the cleaning head were fixed, it would bump in and try and bounce the robot. So, much like the wheels, the cleaning head actually floats. And this allows it to maintain the optimum force down on the floor as it cleans, 
and automatically adapt as we go from a hardwood floor to a heavily carpeted floor. So two of the five motors that we have in the robot assembly are actually within this cleaning head. One of them we use uh, to actuate the rubber rollers and the other one we use uh, to actuate our blower motor. So within our cleaning head we actually also have two out of the three steps for cleaning. There are agitation, suction, and then collection, which happens in the bin. So with agitation, uh, like we mentioned, we use the rubber rollers and that collects the debris. Um, suction comes from the blower motor. And to take it back one step, this is actually from our 500, 500 series. series. And so you'll see that our brushes are different. In our current model, we use rubber brushes for both. Um, and for our dual brushes in the 500 series, we have one rubber brush and one bristle brush. Uh, Lewis, let's go through the primary differences uh, through this evolution. Sure. Um, the bristle brush is really no different than a hairbrush. The disadvantage of using a hairbrush to clean carpet is it, much like a hairbrush, wraps hair around it. So you would have to routinely take these out and pull the hair and cut the hair away from the brush. With the new air extractors, the rubberized extractors, they don't have the same bristle structure. So they are much, much, much less likely to wrap hair around them. So it requires much less user intervention. So we've been making the Roomba since 2002. And as you can see, uh, we've had an evolution in cleaning heads. This is because with engineering, there's always uh, iteration and improvement and research that goes into you know, making your you know, first design better. Through our evolution, we went through uh, dual brushes, so both rubber and bristle, to uh, rubber and uh, bristle combination, all the way to, uh, this was our first evolution, into just dual rubber brushes. So now that we've taken the robot apart, you can see that the robot is made up of a bunch of different modules, but they, they aren't really just smushed together, they're actually placed very deliberately within the robot. Um, you can see that all of our robots have wheels, they all have casters, they all need a battery compartment, uh, space for a cleaning head, and space for a bin. This form factor is really important for us to maintain, and actually we have a really deliberate height that we design our robots to. If you can imagine how a robot would move around your house, uh, we put a lot of thought into the spaces that a robot might travel to. Uh, we've designed the robot so that uh, it is short enough to get under the couch, um, but still can accommodate all the modules it needs to. This is a product of testing that we do here at iRobot. Lewis, you're involved in that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what tests we put our robots through? Sure. It takes about three to four years to develop a robot, and then when you're done, you have to prove that the design works, and you have to simulate every environment we think the robot will come across. Um, so we do environmental testing, uh, temperature testing, uh, shake, rattle, and roll, where the robot undergoes something as simple as if someone drops the UPS box, does the robot survive? We test battery life, we test cleaning performance, um, we test reliability, how many years will it last in the field before the wheel modules fail, the motors fail, uh, but testing is a very large part of robot development. Well, Lewis, thank you so much for being an invaluable resource and for letting us into your lab. My pleasure, anytime, happy to do it. Hey Lauren. Oh, hey Irene, how are you? What are you doing here? Um, I'm taking some notes. So I'm, you know, working on our Roomba i7 and doing a little bit of uh, work to get ready for a study that we're doing. That's awesome. Here we have Lauren. I just met her in the IDUX room here at iRobot. And a lot of work that we do here is about helping customers understand what the robot is doing and yeah. how a lot of these behaviors are very purposeful. Lauren, could you help us walk through that process, what it's like here doing that? Yeah, so um, what I do is I'm on the design team or the user experience team. And so a lot of my job is about understanding how people interact with the robot, what the relationship is that they have with it. When you buy a Roomba or a Brava, it's sort of like getting a pet or a family member. You're bringing this autonomous thing into your home that's moving on its own. And so there's all of these um, things that you might see it doing, like driving around, cleaning 
a specific spot, like we have dirt detect that goes back and forth when it finds a really dirty area. And so when we think about the robot's behavior and how we want it to behave, we also want to make sure that it's clear to the user, which is what we call the people who own the robot, the customer, um, what the robot is doing. And then also we want to make sure that we give them ways to tell the robot what to do and for the robot to tell them what it needs. So for example, if the bin needs to be emptied, the robot needs to tell the user that. Just like when your dog needs to go outside to go to the bathroom or when it's hungry and you need to feed it, it has to tell you that too. And it's really easy when I talk to you because we can use words and talk to each other. It's a lot harder when the robot can't talk. So when you say the robot's talking, I've heard the robots make sounds before. Can you yeah. take us through you know, how you get to those sounds? Yeah, so there are a bunch of different things that can happen with sound. So that's sort of the most natural way for the robot to communicate to us because we're used to talking to each other. So one way that the robot might make sounds or one time the robot makes sounds is when there's an error, when something's mm. gone wrong. So one of the things that we know from the user experience side is that it's much easier if you can tell someone what the problem is. So old Roombas used to say like error 32 and then you would have to go look up what error 32 mm. was. So now it'll say um, like error bin full and then you know you need to empty the bin. Empty the bin. We've been able to add in some voice, uh, natural voice like that. Um, the designers have worked really hard on creating a voice that's clear and easy to understand. Another way that the, the robot can communicate is with sounds like beeps and boops, uh, mm -hmm. musical sounds, and the design team helps with that as well, figuring out what those tones should be um, and what kind of um, thing they're, they're projecting. So you may have a really happy sound when the robot finishes its job and it's celebrating that it cleaned, whereas you want a more serious sound when there's a problem and it needs help. So thinking about totally. those kinds of things is up to the designers. A touch is another way that obviously people communicate with each other, so it would be mean of me to like poke you, but I could and then you would know I wanted your attention. So on the robot we have buttons and that's a way that us as users, humans, can communicate to the robot that that's what we want to do. So we can push the home button and say, okay, now I want you to go home. And that gives a signal to the robot. And so when we think about buttons, the industrial design team, which thinks about sort of the physical design of the robot, um, they help with that. They help come up with what, how hard you should have to press the button, what that experience should be like. These are cap touch buttons, which means that you don't actually have to press them very hard at all. They're sort of like the buttons on your cell phone, mm -hmm. where they just sort of know and can sense your finger. Um, so the industrial design team worked on that. And then the user experience team also helps and thinks about what should the icon be? How do we want to communicate to people? When should a button press really be necessary? Um, so there's a bunch of different ways that the team works together, all the different um, specialized groups to figure out what we should do. So buttons are a big part of that. And then our big button here, the clean button, if I press that, so we heard a sound. So that's signaling to us, right, that the robot's now awake. So we woke him up. And then it says clean here, because that's what we want to do most of the time, is have the robot clean. And then you'll notice that this button has light underneath it too. So we have this light, what's called a light ring, which is this round light. And that's another way that the i7 in particular um, communicates, and the S9 now too. So mm -hmm. when the light's white, it's cleaning, or it's in kind of a normal state. Sometimes the light moves around to show that the robot's working. Then when the light turns blue, it usually means that the robot's doing something special. So it might be going home um, and navigating, or it might be have found a really dirty spot, and it's cleaning that area, so it's activated dirt detect mode. So we're communicating information to the user through the different patterns that the light ring the different colors that the light ring turns. And so that was something else that the design team worked on. So a designer sort of figured out what that light should look like in all those different patterns. That's awesome, yeah. Speaking of buttons, you mentioned we have cap touch buttons here. Um, and we also have physical buttons on our robot, as we talked about previously when yeah. we went over the bin. And so we have both physical button here and a physical button here. So. Yeah. We have all types of buttons. And both of those have a trash can icon on them, which is something else the team added to help make it clear that that's how you empty the bin. And that's where the bin is. Great. Do you just pick a trash can icon? <laughs> like you pick the one that you like best or how do you come across um, those yeah. decisions? Um, so the team will come up with a bunch of different ideas. So a really important part of the design team is what we call iteration. So mm -hmm. it's where you come up with a lot of ideas and then talk to other people. So our whole design team mm -hmm. um, gets together once a week and we have design review and we get to see what everyone's working on and talk to them about their ideas and it gives us a great chance to collaborate and decide on things like maybe three or four of the best icons to look at. And then we test those with other people with you 
users to get a sense of what's the easiest to understand. So when we want something to be easy to understand without you really knowing anything, that's called intuitive. Mm. So when we want something to be really easy for people to figure out, we want, say, an icon to be intuitive. We'll test a bunch of different icons and see which one is easiest for people. So for something like the trash can icon, we might put a bunch of different versions on a robot. We either like make decals or stickers and put them on different robots and then show people who have never seen the robot before the robot and say, hey, can you find the trash bin and empty it? And then we let them figure it out and we watch them do that and we talk to them about it. And then we sort of look at the patterns across all of the people that we talk to and then we understand, okay, this was the easiest one. And then the team, because we have artists and creative people on the team, will like make it look nice and fit within our overall design, but they really are building on what we understand about our users. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Lauren. No problem. Thanks for visiting me in the lab. This was fun. All right, that was awesome. Even though I work with robots every single day, I continually find myself learning new things about iRobot, Roomba, and all the technology that we work with. So now that you've gotten a glimpse of what it takes to build a robot, we have a question for you. What robot would you build? What problems would it solve? What would it look like and how would it move? These are all questions we think about at iRobot. It all starts with an idea and we want to hear yours. Let us know in the comments. Thanks for joining us today. Stay curious and keep innovating.